I don't want to die, driver, in this world. If it happened, um, it would be horrible. The earth shudders violently beneath our feet. Suddenly, the skies above Yellowstone National Park, which were once a canvas of blue, are now painted with dark, ominous clouds. A gargantuan plume of ash and fire erupts, reaching out to the heavens. Even cities that once felt removed from any immediate danger, like Denver and Salt Lake City, find themselves under a looming shadow of ash. The horizon, which once held the promise of a new day, is now blurred, and our ever-shining sun is veiled. Air travel across North America comes to a screeching halt. Airports, the hubs of modern connectivity, sound their alarms, grounding flights as the ash-filled skies become a no-fly zone. This ash, thick and relentless, begins its descent, casting a premature night over the land. It covers streets, homes, entire cities in a suffocating gray layer. The sheer weight of this ash is so immense that buildings, our feats of engineering, strain under it. Some even collapse. Within Yellowstone, a place of natural beauty and wonder, the landscape undergoes a hellish transformation. Molten rock courses through the land, obliterating everything in its wake. The symphony of wildlife, once a hallmark of this region, is now drowned by the eruption's deafening roar. But the ramifications of this eruption aren't just confined to the American continent. News channels globally broadcast this geological catastrophe, and experts predict a volcanic winter. As sulfur-laden clouds spread, a cold descends upon the earth, a stark reminder of nature's power. People worldwide, glued to their screens, watch in a mix of horror and disbelief. The eruption of Yellowstone isn't just a geological event, it's a defining moment for Earth and its inhabitants. This may sound like a scene from a disaster movie, but it could actually happen in real life. Yellowstone National Park is home to one of the largest and most active volcanic systems in the world, capable of producing cataclysmic eruptions that could affect millions of people and change the climate of the planet. In this video, we will explore the history, the science, and the potential future of the Yellowstone supervolcano and find out what experts say about this looming threat. Yellowstone National Park is located in the northwest corner of Wyoming, USA, and extends into parts of Montana and Idaho. It covers an area of about 3,500 square miles, making it larger than some U.S. states. It is famous for its diverse natural features, such as geysers, hot springs, waterfalls, canyons, lakes, rivers, forests, and mountains. It is also home to hundreds of species of animals, including bears, wolves, bison, elk, moose, and eagles. But beneath this beautiful landscape lies a hidden danger, a massive magma chamber that fuels the park's geothermal activity and holds the potential for explosive volcanic eruptions. This magma chamber is part of a larger volcanic system that spans across the eastern part of Idaho and forms what is known as the Yellowstone Hotspot. In the vast expanse of our planet's geology, there exists a phenomenon that challenges our typical understanding of where and how volcanoes form, the hotspot. Unlike the majority of Earth's volcanoes, which arise from the boundaries of shifting tectonic plates, hotspots are born from regions where molten rock or magma surges upwards from deep within the Earth's mantle. These hotspots remain relatively stationary, enduring for millions of years, even as the tectonic plates above them shift and slide. Among the tapestry of hotspots on Earth, the Yellowstone stands as a testament to nature's raw power and the intricate dance of geology. This hotspot has been active for an awe-inspiring 16 million years. Its legacy? Some of the most colossal volcanic eruptions known to science. These eruptions, occurring over vast stretches of time, have carved out immense depressions we recognize as calderas. Imagine a volcanic eruption of such magnitude that it depletes its magma reservoir, causing the land above to collapse into the void left behind. The Yellowstone hotspot's timeline is marked by the creation of three significant calderas. The Island Park caldera emerged 2.1 million years ago, followed by the Henry's Fork caldera 1.3 million years ago. The most recent, the Yellowstone caldera, made its mark 631,000 years ago. These calderas, vast and imposing, 
can be discerned from space as distinct circular formations. The Yellowstone caldera, in particular, is a marvel of geology. Spanning an area of about 30 by 45 miles, it's a dominant feature of the park. Its formation was a result of an eruption that released approximately 240 cubic miles of material into the atmosphere. This wasn't just a localized event. Its repercussions were felt globally. The eruption influenced the Earth's climate for years and deposited a layer of ash that can still be traced across North America today. Picture this, a vast expanse of land, teeming with life, harboring a force so immense that it's earned the title of the Yellowstone supervolcano. This isn't just any ordinary volcano. It's one that can unleash super eruptions. Now you might wonder, what sets a supervolcano apart from its peers? The answer lies in the Volcanic Explosivity Index, VEI. The term supervolcano isn't just a dramatic moniker. It's a scientific classification. A supervolcano is distinguished by its ability to produce an eruption of magnitude 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. This means it has the power to spew forth over 240 cubic miles of material. Such cataclysmic events are so rare that they've only graced our planet a handful of times throughout its vast history. And when they do occur, they leave an indelible mark, affecting life and climate on a scale that's hard to fathom. The Volcanic Explosivity Index is akin to a Richter scale for volcanoes, gauging the size and ferocity of eruptions. It spans from 0 to 8, with each step marking a tenfold increase in intensity, save for the jump between 0 and 2. To grasp the sheer power of a supervolcano, consider Mount St. Helens, which typically registers a VE of 3 or 4. Now juxtapose that with the cataclysmic eruption of Tambora in Indonesia in 1815, which reached a VEI of 7. The scale of devastation is almost beyond comprehension. While our planet is dotted with several supervolcanoes, many have long since fallen silent. But Yellowstone is an exception. It's not just active, it's pulsating with life. Over the past 2.1 million years, this behemoth has erupted thrice, each time reshaping the landscape with a vast caldera. These depressions are the scars left behind when the ground collapses post-eruption. The Huckleberry Ridge eruption, 2.1 million years ago, birthed a caldera spanning 50 by 40 miles. The Mesa Falls eruption, 1.3 million years ago, left behind a 10 by 14 miles caldera. And the Lava Creek eruption, a mere 630,000 years ago, sculpted the 34 by 50 miles caldera we marvel at today when we visit Yellowstone National Park. Now, the question on everyone's mind, will Yellowstone erupt again? If so, when? And what might the aftermath look like? To unravel these mysteries, we must journey beneath the Earth's crust to the very heart of the magma system that fuels Yellowstone. Magma, birthed in the fiery depths of Earth's mantle or crust, varies in its composition. Depending on its origins and the rocks it mingles with, we categorize it as basaltic, anacidic, or rhyolitic. Each type boasts a unique blend of elements. Silica, in particular, plays a pivotal role, influencing the magma's viscosity and gas content. Basaltic magma, with its low silica content, flows freely and is less explosive. And dacitic magma strikes a balance, being more viscous and explosive. Rheolitic magma, rich in silica, is incredibly thick and volatile. Yellowstone's magma is predominantly rhyolitic, this means it's not just viscous, but also laden with gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. These gases are the catalysts for volcanic eruptions. As magma ascends, pressure drops, causing these gases to expand into bubbles, propelling the magma outwards. But the viscosity of rhyolitic magma makes it challenging for these gases to escape, building immense pressure within the magma chamber. When this pressure surpasses the resilience of the surrounding rocks, a monumental eruption ensues. The birth of Yellowstone's rhyolitic magma is a tale of tectonic dance. Positioned on the edge of the North American plate, Yellowstone is in constant motion, gliding westward over a stationary hotspot deep within the mantle. This hotspot, a region where scorching plumes of mantle material ascend, crafts volcanoes on the Earth's surface. As the tectonic plate drifts over this hotspot, a lineage of volcanoes emerges, reminiscent of the formation of the Hawaiian Islands over eons. 
While the Hawaiian Islands paint a vivid picture of paradise with their basaltic lava, sculpted from the melting of oceanic crust over a hot spot, Yellowstone tells a different tale. Here, the story is penned in rhyolitic lava, a byproduct of the continental crust melting over a similar hot spot. But what sets the continental crust apart? It's thicker, richer in composition, boasting higher levels of silica, and significantly less iron and magnesium compared to its oceanic counterpart. When this continental crust, with its unique composition, melts over a hot spot, it births rhyolitic magma. But nature, in its infinite wisdom and patience, doesn't allow this magma to erupt immediately. Due to its viscous nature, akin to thick honey, it doesn't flow effortlessly through the crust. Instead, it bides its time, gathering in vast magma chambers beneath the Earth's surface. Here, in these subterranean cauldrons, the magma undergoes a series of fascinating transformations, each amplifying its explosive potential. Let's delve into these processes. 1. Asterisk, asterisk, partial melting. The surrounding rocks, which share a similar felsic composition, begin to melt. This adds even more silica to the already silica-rich magma, enhancing its viscosity. 2. Asterisk, asterisk, crystal settling. Picture denser minerals like iron and magnesium, gracefully descending, settling at the bottom of this magma chamber. This leaves the upper layers of the magma even richer in felsic content and brimming with gases. 3. Asterisk, asterisk, magma fusion. In a dance of elements, the magma occasionally mingles with other magmas from varied sources. It could be the basaltic magma, a gift from the hot spot, or the andesitic magma, a product of subduction zones. This union can elevate the temperature, pressure, and gas content of the magma, further intensifying its explosive nature. Nature's clock ticks differently, and these processes can span hundreds of thousands of years. All the while, the magma chamber swells, growing in size and power. And then, a moment arrives, a tipping point, when the Earth's crust can no longer restrain this bubbling cauldron. The stage is set, and the supervolcano awakens, heralding an eruption of unimaginable scale. So, the fact that most of the magma chamber is solid rock, yet it still contains enough molten rhyolite to potentially feed a massive supervolcanic eruption, makes Yellowstone's subterranean system quite astounding from a geological perspective. Beneath the park's surface lies a complex network of molten rock. At shallower depths, between 3 to 10 miles below, there's a magma chamber filled predominantly with rhyolite magma. This magma is unique. It's rich in silica, making it incredibly viscous and when it erupts, explosively so. But here's the catch. This chamber is mostly solid, with only about 5 to 15 percent of it in a molten state. Deeper still, between 12 to 28 miles underground lies a more expansive magma reservoir. This reservoir is filled with basalt magma, which is less viscous and less explosive than its rhyolite counterpart. Much like the shallower chamber, this deeper reservoir is also primarily solid, with a mere 2% of it being molten. This intricate magma system is akin to a living, breathing entity. It's in a constant state of flux. The deeper reservoir feeds the shallower chamber, which in turn powers the park's geothermal wonders and occasionally leads to eruptions. The nature and magnitude of these eruptions depend on a myriad of factors, from the composition of the magma to the pressures and stresses at play. Yellowstone's most frequent tantrums come in the form of hydrothermal eruptions. Picture hot water and steam erupting violently from the ground. While many of these are small, some, like the one that birthed the west thumb of Yellowstone Lake about 150,000 years ago, can be quite destructive. Then there are the lava flows, where magma gracefully makes its way to the surface, flowing like a river of fire. These eruptions, while less explosive than hydrothermal ones, can be vast in scale. For instance, the eruptions that sculpted the Pitchstone Plateau and the Madison Plateau occurred roughly 70,000 years ago. But the eruptions that truly capture our imagination and fear are the caldera-forming ones. These are the rarest, yet the most devastating. They occur when vast volumes of rhyolite magma erupt with such ferocity that they form a new caldera. With such potential for destruction, it's no wonder that scientists and researchers have their eyes firmly fixed on Yellowstone. Using cutting-edge technology, they're tracking magma movement, 
measuring how the ground deforms and keeping tabs on seismic activity. One particular sign that keeps the researchers on their toes is the uplift of the ground above the magma chamber. It's a telltale sign that magma is on the move, pressurizing the crust. Over the years, Yellowstone has seen its fair share of uplifts and subsidence. But between 2013 and 2014, something unusual happened. An area within the Norris Geyser Basin began rising at an unprecedented rate of about 5.9 inches annually. This dramatic uplift culminated in a magnitude 4.9 earthquake in March 2014, signaling the end of the uplift and the onset of subsidence. So, what was behind this extraordinary event? Recent studies, particularly one from the U.S. Geological Survey in 2020, suggest that this ground deformation was likely due to magma intruding deep beneath the Norris Geyser Basin between 1996 and 2001. This magma, over the years, rose to shallower depths, possibly coming within a few hundred yards of the surface by 2014. Laden with volatile gases like water vapor and carbon dioxide, the pressure within the reservoir surged, causing the ground to bulge. The 2014 earthquake might have been nature's way of releasing some of these pent-up gases, allowing the land to settle once more. Have you ever stood at the edge of a vast expanse and felt the pulse of the earth beneath your feet? That's the sensation one might get when pondering the mysteries of the Norris Geyser Basin in Yellowstone. Since 2018, this area has been a hotbed of geological intrigue. The Steamboat Geyser, a natural wonder and the world's tallest active geyser, has been particularly restless. Its eruptions, once predictable, have become more frequent, even setting a new record in 2019 with an astounding 48 eruptions in a single year. But what's behind this sudden surge in activity? Researchers believe that the accumulation of magma just beneath the surface might be the culprit. This magma, while not immediately dangerous, has the potential to cause hydrothermal explosions. These are dramatic events where superheated water turns instantly to steam, propelling rocks and debris into the air with immense force. But let's zoom out a bit and look at the bigger picture, the Yellowstone Supervolcano Magma Chamber. Recent studies have unveiled some startling revelations. This chamber, a cauldron of molten rock deep beneath the Earth's surface, holds a far greater volume of molten rock than previously believed. Scientists, using the echoes of seismic waves, have been able to determine the consistency of this magma. Instead of a bubbling boiling pot of liquid rock, they found a magmatic mush, a blend of solid rock, semi-liquid crystals, and volatile gases. This discovery is significant. Eruptions, history tells us, are more likely when about half of the space in the upper magma reservoir is filled with this molten mixture. The magma system beneath Yellowstone is vast, with two main chambers. The deeper one is enormous, dwarfing the shallower chamber by about 4.5 times. While the deeper chamber is relatively stable with about 2% melt, the upper chamber is where things get interesting. A study from 2022 estimated its melt content to be between 16% and 20%. However, Sin Mei Wu and her team have brought a new perspective to the table. Using advanced seismic wave data, they've determined that the upper chamber actually consists of around 28% melt. This is a significant increase from the previous estimate. But before alarm bells start ringing, Wu offers a note of reassurance. Even with this higher percentage, it's not enough to signal an imminent eruption. As she puts it, Yellowstone will not have an imminent eruption. This groundbreaking understanding of magma reservoirs has implications far beyond Yellowstone. It offers a blueprint that could be applied globally, helping scientists assess eruption risks in other volcanic regions. Michael Poland, a leading figure at the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, has praised the methodology used in this study. He likens the magma at Yellowstone to a thick lentil soup, emphasizing that it's not purely molten, but contains a significant amount of solid material. Yet, as with all scientific endeavors, there are still unknowns, while we've made significant strides in understanding the supervolcano, there's still much we don't know. Wu and her team are eager to delve deeper, hoping to determine if the magma contains other elements that could influence eruption dynamics. So, is Yellowstone on the brink of a cataclysmic eruption? The consensus among researchers is, not necessarily. The recent findings are intriguing, but they don't necessarily spell doom. 
The researchers stress that such events have been observed in Yellowstone's past without leading to a major eruption. Moreover, the amount of magma involved is relatively small in comparison to the entire reservoir, and most of it remains solid. In the grand tapestry of Earth's geological history, Yellowstone remains a captivating chapter, a testament to the dynamic and ever-evolving nature of our planet. So in the intricate dance of Earth's geological ballet, the exact moment and nature of Yellowstone's next significant eruption remains shrouded in mystery. However, Yellowstone has experienced smaller eruptions and episodes of uplift and subsidence, indicating that the volcanic system is still alive and dynamic. One of the experts who has studied Yellowstone extensively is Neil deGrasse Tyson, a renowned astrophysicist and science communicator. He has said that Yellowstone is not only a natural wonder and a national treasure, but also a living laboratory and a learning opportunity. By studying its volcanic history and activity, we can learn more about the Earth's interior and evolution, as well as our own vulnerability and resilience. He has also warned that a large eruption at Yellowstone could have devastating consequences for the regional and global climate, agriculture, health, and economy. Therefore, he said, it is important to be prepared and informed, and to support scientific research and monitoring efforts at Yellowstone. So let's start with the most likely scenario, a small eruption. A small eruption would not be a caldera forming event, but rather a lava flow or a hydrothermal explosion. A lava flow is when magma reaches the surface and flows out of a vent or a fissure. A hydrothermal explosion is when hot water or steam builds up pressure underground and bursts out violently. Both types of eruptions are relatively common at Yellowstone and have occurred several times in the past few thousand years. A small eruption would cause local damage to the park's infrastructure and ecosystem. It could destroy roads, bridges, power lines, or water supplies. It could also harm or kill plants and animals in the affected area. Depending on the direction and intensity of the wind, it could also spread ash over nearby towns or cities, reducing visibility and air quality. However, a small eruption would not pose a major threat to life or property outside of the immediate vicinity of the park. A small eruption would also not have significant impacts on the global climate or environment. The amount of ash and gas released by a small eruption would be too low to alter the atmospheric composition or temperature significantly. The effects would be short-lived and localized. However, a small eruption could also be a precursor to a larger one. Scientists have found evidence that some of the past caldera-forming eruptions at Yellowstone were preceded by smaller eruptions that occurred within years or decades before the main event. These smaller eruptions could have triggered or accelerated the magma ascent and pressure buildup that led to the catastrophic explosion. This brings us to the second scenario, a massive supereruption. A supereruption is defined as an eruption that ejects more than 240 cubic miles of material into the atmosphere. Such an eruption would create a huge caldera in the ground, similar to or larger than the existing one at Yellowstone. It would also produce enormous amounts of ash, gas, and lava that would cover vast areas of land and affect the global climate for years. A massive supereruption would have catastrophic consequences for the local environment and population. It would obliterate everything within tens or hundreds of miles from the epicenter. It would bury large parts of North America under several yard of ash. It would release toxic gases such as sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and fluorine that could poison humans, animals, and plants. It would also generate pyroclastic flows, fast-moving clouds of hot ash and gas, that could travel hundreds of miles from the source and incinerate everything in their path. A massive supereruption would also have severe impacts on the global climate and environment. The ash cloud from such an eruption would rise high into the stratosphere and spread around the world, blocking sunlight and reducing temperatures. This could cause a volcanic winter that could last for several years, affecting crop growth and food security. The sulfur dioxide from the eruption would also react with water vapor in the atmosphere and form sulfuric acid droplets that could reflect more sunlight and cool the planet further. This could also cause acid rain that could damage soil, water, and vegetation. The carbon dioxide from the eruption would also contribute to the greenhouse effect and global warming, potentially offsetting or enhancing the cooling effects of the ash and sulfur. 
Another of the experts who has warned about the potential impacts of a massive super eruption at Yellowstone is Mikio Kaku, a famous physicist and science popularizer. He has said that a super eruption at Yellowstone would be a global catastrophe that would destroy the United States as we know it. He has also said that there would be little warning time or escape options for such an event, and that all you can do is run. Imagine for a moment standing on the precipice of an erupting volcano. The ground trembles beneath your feet, the sky darkens, and a question looms large. Where can one possibly seek refuge from such a cataclysmic event? The unsettling truth as it stands today is that there isn't much ground to cover. The U.S. Geological Survey, the guardians of our geological knowledge, suggest that the odds of witnessing a colossal caldera-forming eruption at Yellowstone in the foreseeable future are minuscule. The more plausible narrative sees Yellowstone humming with its usual symphony of minor tremors, ground shifts, and geothermal wonders, all without spelling doom for its visitors or nearby inhabitants. Yet, in the realm of science, complacency is a luxury we can't afford. Even the whisper of an eruption at Yellowstone demands our attention. A seemingly minor eruption could ripple through the local ecosystem, leaving scars on both the environment and human-made structures. It's a clarion call for vigilance, for staying informed and heeding the guidance of those who monitor these geological giants. Visualize the aftermath of such an eruption. A towering ash cloud, ascending to kiss the stratosphere, casting its shadow across continents, dimming the sun's warmth. This could plunge our world into a chilling volcanic winter, potentially spanning years, casting uncertainty over our agricultural yields and food supplies. The eruption's sulfur dioxide, in its dance with atmospheric water vapor, would birth droplets of sulfuric acid, further dimming our skies and possibly unleashing acid rains, threatening our soils, water bodies, and plant life. And amidst this cooling, the carbon dioxide released could play its part in the global warming narrative, either amplifying or counteracting the chilling effects of ash and sulfur. But the ash, that seemingly innocuous gray powder, might be one of our gravest concerns, comprising minuscule shards of rock, minerals, and volcanic glass. These particles are abrasive and non-soluble. Breathing them in, or even just coming into contact, could irritate or damage our eyes, respiratory system, and skin. Our water and food sources aren't safe either, with potential contamination from toxic substances or harmful microorganisms. And in our interconnected world, Ash could disrupt communication and transportation, wreaking havoc on our modern lifelines. Michio Kaku has said that ash fall from a super eruption at Yellowstone would be like a blanket of death that would destroy civilization as we know it. He has also said that there would be little warning time or escape options for such an event. So in the face of such an eventuality, how do we respond? Is there a grand evacuation blueprint? The answer is not very clear as there is no official evacuation plan for a super eruption at Yellowstone. But hope isn't lost. There exist broad guidelines and wisdom that could be our guiding light in such dire times. The first step is to stay informed and follow the advice of local authorities. They will provide information on the status of the volcano, the expected impacts of the eruption, and the best course of action. They will also coordinate the evacuation efforts and the provision of emergency services and supplies. The second step is to prepare an emergency kit and a family plan. The emergency kit should include items such as water, food, medicine, flashlight, radio, batteries, masks, goggles, gloves, and cash. The family plan should include contact information, meeting points, evacuation routes, and alternative destinations. The third step is to evacuate as soon as possible if instructed by authorities. The evacuation should be done in a calm and orderly manner following the designated routes and avoiding areas that are prone to flooding, landslides, or pyroclastic flows. The evacuation should also be done in a safe and responsible way, avoiding unnecessary risks or delays. The fourth step is to seek shelter in a safe place away from the volcano. The shelter should be sturdy and well-ventilated, preferably with a basement or underground level. The shelter should also be equipped with water, food, medicine, and communication devices. The shelter should also be protected from ashfall by closing doors and windows, 
covering vents and chimneys, and removing ash from roofs and gutters. The fifth step is to stay alert and updated on the situation. The situation could change rapidly and unpredictably, requiring further actions or adjustments. The situation could also last for a long time, requiring patience and resilience. Picture a thick blanket of ash covering USA, turning bustling cities into ghost towns and lush forests into barren wastelands. The question that might be gnawing at your mind is, in the face of such a cataclysm, is there any sanctuary within the US? Could any shelter possibly shield us from this volcanic wrath? The reality, my friends, is a tad unsettling. A super eruption at Yellowstone would unleash consequences so profound that they'd be challenging to sidestep or even mitigate. According to some studies, a super eruption at Yellowstone could cover most of the continental US with at least 0.4 inches of ash. This would affect about 90 million people and cause billions of dollars in damage. Some areas closer to the volcano could receive up to several feet of ash, making them uninhabitable for years. But the repercussions wouldn't just be local. This eruption would have the audacity to challenge the very climate of our planet. We could witness a drop in global temperatures by 5, 9 degrees Fahrenheit, playing havoc with precipitation patterns. The domino effect, failed crops, widespread famines, unpredictable droughts and floods, the spread of diseases, heightened conflicts, mass migrations, and even the tragic extinction of certain species. Beyond the tangible, the psychological scars of such an event would run deep. The very fabric of society could be strained with emotions ranging from fear, stress, and depression to anger, grief, and guilt. The eruption could fracture communities, disrupt families, challenge religious beliefs, and even destabilize governments and economies. Facing such an unprecedented challenge would demand unparalleled cooperation, extraordinary measures, and yes, a good dose of luck and hope. Now let's pivot to another pressing concern, the unpredictability of it all. Predicting the tantrums of a volcano, especially one as intricate as Yellowstone, is akin to reading tea leaves. One of the monumental tasks is gauging the odds of a super eruption at Yellowstone. While the U.S. Geological Survey offers a semblance of solace, suggesting a low likelihood of such an eruption, it's crucial to remember that these estimates hinge on statistical models. These models peer into the volcano's past to predict its future, but they often overlook the myriad uncertainties and complexities governing volcanic tantrums. Factors like tectonic shifts, climate variations, or even human interventions aren't always accounted for. So, while these probabilities offer valuable insights, they aren't gospel truth. They shouldn't lull us into complacency or stoke undue panic. Instead, they should serve as tools to enlighten both the public and policymakers about the myriad scenarios Yellowstone's fury could unleash. But here's a twist in our tale. What if instead of erupting, Yellowstone simply fades away? This segues us into another conundrum, the enigma of a volcano's life cycle. A volcano earns the label extinct when it's been dormant for eons, showing no signs of future tantrums. Dormant volcanoes are those silent for long stretches but still harboring the potential to awaken. And then there are the active ones, either recently erupted or showing signs of an imminent outburst. So, what if Yellowstone in its geological timeline simply decides to retire? It's a thought worth pondering. Currently, Yellowstone wears the badge of an active volcano. Why? Well, over the past few million years, it's thrown quite a few tantrums. And even today, it whispers tales of its might through the geysers and hot springs that dot its landscape. Yet, in the vast corridors of scientific discourse, a theory has emerged, suggesting that Yellowstone might be singing its swan song. It's been a staggering 631,000 years since this behemoth last had a major outburst. Could it be that its once fiery heart is now cooling? Turning from molten rage to solid rock? This hypothesis hinges on the idea that the fiery rivers of magma, flowing from the Earth's mantle to its crust, are ebbing. The once vibrant volcanic system might be running out of steam, quite literally. One of the scientists who has proposed this idea is Michio Kaku. He has said that Yellowstone might be a dying giant that has exhausted its fuel and run out of steam. He has also said that Yellowstone might have one last hurrah before it goes extinct, 
but that this is unlikely to happen anytime soon. However, as with all scientific debates, there's another side to this coin. However, other scientists have challenged this idea, arguing that Yellowstone still has enough heat and magma to erupt again, and that there is no evidence that it is dying or cooling down. They point to the fact that beneath this vast national park, a magma chamber still bubbles, periodically rejuvenated by fresh, scorching magma from the depths of the mantle. The very ground at Yellowstone radiates heat, a testament to the geothermal dynamism that lies below. Furthermore, they argue that predicting Yellowstone's eruptions by looking at past patterns is a bit like predicting the weather by looking at yesterday's clouds. The intervals between its eruptions have been erratic, spanning anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. So in their view, Yellowstone remains an enigma, capable of springing a surprise at any moment or perhaps choosing eternal slumber. The riddle of whether Yellowstone will once again roar to life or gently fade into geological history is, at present, unsolvable. It's a puzzle with pieces scattered across time, space, and the very depths of our planet. But let's not forget, Yellowstone isn't Earth's only volcanic marvel. Over the past century, numerous volcanoes have erupted, reshaping landscapes and altering lives. These events serve as a window offering us glimpses of what a super eruption at Yellowstone might entail and the profound impacts it could have on our world. This is Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, a seemingly peaceful behemoth that, in 1991, awoke from its slumber with a roar that echoed around the world. So, Mount Pinatubo's eruption on June 15, 1991, was nothing short of monumental. It was one of the 20th century's most powerful displays of nature's fury ranking a six on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. We've talked about this before, but I'll remind you just in case. It gauges the intensity of eruptions, considering factors like the volume of material spewed, the height of the eruption column, and its duration. To put it in perspective, a VEI of six means the eruption spewed out an astonishing volume of over 2.4 cubic miles of material with the eruption column piercing the sky at over 16 miles and the event lasting more than a day. The months leading up to this cataclysmic event were marked by telltale signs, tremors beneath the earth, the ground swelling, gases escaping, and steam explosions. These early warnings allowed scientists and local authorities to spring into action, orchestrating the evacuation of over 200,000 individuals from the danger zones. When Pinatubo finally erupted, it sent a colossal plume of ash and gas soaring up to 25 miles into the stratosphere, casting a shadow over much of Southeast Asia, disrupting flights and reducing visibility. The eruption's pyroclastic flows, which are essentially superheated avalanches of gas and ash, raced down the mountain, obliterating everything in their wake. The aftermath was heart-wrenching. Over 800 souls were lost, primarily due to the weight of ash causing structures to collapse or the deadly lahars which are mud flows formed when rain mixes with volcanic debris. Over a million people were uprooted from their homes, their lives forever altered. Infrastructure, including two pivotal U.S. military bases, was decimated. The region's agriculture, water sources, and power generation systems were severely impacted. But Pinatubo's influence wasn't just local. Its eruption had a ripple effect, altering global climates, the ash and gases it released dimmed the sun's rays by a staggering 20%, causing temperatures to drop globally by about 1.8 Fahrenheit for several years. The eruption's sulfur dioxide mingled with atmospheric water vapor, creating sulfuric acid droplets, which further cooled our planet and led to acid rain, damaging ecosystems. And while the carbon dioxide released might have contributed to global warming, its effects were likely overshadowed by the cooling caused by the ash and sulfur. Now let's shift our gaze to another volcanic titan, Mount Tambora. Its eruption in 1816 was so impactful that it's often referred to as the year without a summer. This year was characterized by a chilling cold, unexpected frosts, and even snow during summer months, leading to widespread crop failures and subsequent famines. This climatic anomaly even left its mark on literature with the dreary weather serving as a backdrop for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and John Polidori's The Vampire. Dr. Clive Oppenheimer, 
a renowned volcanologist from Cambridge University, has delved deep into the mysteries of Mount Tambora. He views it as a testament to the profound ways in which volcanoes can shape both our climate and our societies. Through studying these volcanic giants, we gain insights into the intricate dance between Earth's geological forces and the ecosystems and civilizations they influence. Now let's travel to the land of fire and ice, Iceland. Here amidst its rugged landscapes and ethereal beauty lies the volcano Eyjafjallajökull. Now I know that's quite a mouthful, but bear with me. This volcano, after enjoying a peaceful slumber for over 180 years, decided to awaken in 2010, reminding us of the raw power that lies beneath our feet. On April 14, 2010, Eyjafjallajökull erupted, marking one of the most disruptive volcanic events of the 21st century. To give you a sense of its magnitude, it registered a 4 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. In layman's terms, this means that the eruption spewed out more than 0.02 cubic miles of material, with the ash column reaching impressive heights of over 6 miles and the event spanning more than a day. The lead-up to this grand display was not without its signs. For months the Earth trembled with seismic activity, the ground shifted, gases escaped, and smaller eruptions hinted at the impending spectacle. These early warnings allowed scientists and local authorities to spring into action, ensuring the safety of the local populace by evacuating them from the danger zones. When Ajef Yalajokul finally unveiled its might, it sent a vast plume of ash and gas into the skies. This ash cloud, like an uninvited guest, drifted over much of Europe, wreaking havoc on air travel and reducing visibility to a mere whisper. Additionally, the heat from the eruption caused the glacier atop the volcano to melt, leading to floods and mud flows in the surrounding areas. While Ejafjallajökull's eruption didn't claim any lives directly, it wasn't without its consequences. Some individuals suffered injuries or illnesses due to ash exposure, and over 800 people found themselves uprooted from their homes. Infrastructure, including buildings, roads, and power lines, bore the brunt of the eruption, and the local agriculture, water sources, and even the vibrant tourism industry felt its effects. But the ripples of Ejafjallajökull's eruption were felt far beyond Iceland's shores. Picture this. Over 100,000 flights across Europe grounded, leaving more than 10 million passengers stranded and causing economic losses that ran into the billions. This eruption didn't just disrupt travel. It impacted trade, business, education, healthcare, and even the cultural fabric of societies globally. It served as a stark reminder of how interconnected our world truly is. Dr. Thorvaldur Thordersen, a leading volcanologist from the University of Iceland, has delved deep into the mysteries of Ejafjallajökull. He views it as a poignant example of how even in our modern age, we remain at the mercy of nature's whims. Through studying this volcano, he believes we can gain invaluable insights into the intricate dance between volcanoes, glaciers, and the ever-changing climate of our planet. Let's journey now to the Pacific Northwest, to the state of Washington in the USA, where the majestic Mount St. Helens stands. On May 18, 1980, after a slumber of over 120 years, this volcano roared back to life in one of the most catastrophic eruptions the United States has ever witnessed. To give you a sense of its sheer magnitude, it registered a 5 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. This means that the eruption spewed out more than 0.24 cubic miles of material skyward, with the ash column soaring to heights of over 9 miles, all in a span of just over an hour. In the months leading up to this dramatic event, the Earth gave us hints. There were tremors, the ground shifted, gases whispered from the mountain's depths, and smaller eruptions painted the skies. Heeding these signs, scientists and local authorities took action, ensuring over 20,000 people were evacuated from the looming danger. When the main eruption finally occurred, the sheer force of it decapitated the mountain, leaving behind a vast crater approximately 1.2 by 1.8 miles in size. The explosion was so powerful that it sent a lateral blast racing outwards at speeds of up to 180 miles per hour obliterating everything within a 19-mile radius. As if that wasn't enough, a towering plume of ash and gas rose, reaching up to 12 miles into the atmosphere, casting shadows over vast stretches of North America and disrupting air travel. 
The aftermath of Mount St. Helens' eruption was heart-wrenching. 57 souls were lost, primarily due to the overwhelming force of the blast or the searing pyroclastic flows. Over 200 individuals found themselves without homes, their lives upended. Infrastructure crumbled with over 200 structures, including a visitor center and a lodge at the base of the mountain being consumed. The local agriculture, water sources, and power generation systems were severely impacted. Nature, too, bore the brunt of the eruption. Over 230 square miles of lush forests, serene meadows, pristine lakes, and winding rivers were transformed or obliterated. Thousands of animals, including some endangered species like the northern spotted owl and the bull trout, were either killed or displaced. But, as with all things in nature, there's a silver lining. This catastrophe provided a unique opportunity for scientific research and ecological restoration. Researchers have been keenly observing how life, in its tenacity, rebounds after such a cataclysmic event and the role humans play in either aiding or impeding this recovery. Dr. John Pallister, a renowned volcanologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, has often referred to Mount St. Helens as a fascinating natural laboratory. It offers insights into the intricate workings of volcanoes and their profound effects on ecosystems. He believes that by studying such events, we can better comprehend the dual nature of volcanoes as both potential threats and invaluable assets to human societies. The eruptions of Mount Pinatubo, Ajaf Yalajokul, and Mount St. Helens serve as stark reminders of the raw power volcanoes possess. They underscore the myriad ways in which these geological giants can shape our world. Through monitoring, prediction, preparedness, and learning, we can navigate the challenges they present. But this brings us to a pressing question. Why does the mere mention of a potential eruption at Yellowstone send chills down our spines? In a nutshell, while research continues, the sheer complexity and scale of Yellowstone along with limited historical precedents means the chances of reliably predicting a super eruption remains low. This scientific uncertainty amplifies the public unease at the thought of such an event. Let's delve into the heart of a pressing question. How can we truly discern if Yellowstone is teetering on the brink of eruption? How do we predict the unpredictable? This is where the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, or YVO, comes in. This organization stands as a beacon of scientific collaboration, a consortium made up of nine state and federal agencies, all dedicated to the meticulous monitoring of volcanic, hydrothermal, and seismic activities in the Yellowstone region. Established in 2001 through a partnership between the U.S. Geological Survey, the University of Utah, and Yellowstone National Park, the YVO expanded by 2013 to include all nine of its current member organizations. But how do scientists keep tabs on this sleeping giant, ensuring we're not caught off guard by its next move? One of the primary tools in this scientific arsenal is the Global Positioning System, or GPS, stations. These aren't your everyday GPS devices used in cars or phones. Instead, they're specialized instruments designed to track even the minutest movements of the Earth's crust. Spread across Yellowstone, about 40 of these stations continuously monitor the ground's shifts. By analyzing this data, scientists can glean insights into the subterranean movements of magma and other fluids, painting a clearer picture of the volcanic activity brewing beneath. But ground movements are just one piece of the puzzle. To get a more holistic view, scientists also employ strain meters and tilt meters. These devices, though lesser known than their GPS counterparts, are no less critical. They detect subtle changes in the Earth's shape and inclination, acting as early warning systems for potential volcanic activity. Currently, Yellowstone is equipped with six borehole strain meters and four borehole tilt meters, each feeding high-resolution data back to researchers. Seismometers, the guardians of seismic activity, are another crucial component these devices, strategically placed around the park, keep a vigilant watch for earthquakes. Earthquakes can be triggered by a myriad of factors, from shifting tectonic plates to the movement of magma deep below. With around 40 seismometers in place, scientists can monitor, in real time, the heartbeat of the Earth as it rumbles and roars beneath Yellowstone. To understand the chemical dynamics at play, scientists turn to devices affectionately named spiders. These aren't your typical eight-legged creatures. 
but are robotic devices designed to measure the gases escaping from the Earth's depths. By analyzing the composition of these gases, researchers can infer the conditions and chemical dynamics of the magma chambers below. Currently, four of these spiders are deployed within Yellowstone, each acting as a sentinel, monitoring the park's gaseous emissions. Temperature, a direct indicator of volcanic activity, is also meticulously monitored. Using cutting-edge equipment like infrared cameras, thermocouples, and thermal probes, scientists can gauge the heat levels across different regions of the park, offering clues about potential upsurges in volcanic activity. Moreover, Yellowstone's unique geographical position has made it a focal point for seismic research. The U.S. Array Seismic Network, a monumental project spanning 2,000 sites across the U.S., has been invaluable. This network facilitates teleseismic tomography, a technique that uses seismic waves to create detailed images of the Earth's interior. The findings from these studies have been intriguing, to say the least. There's a broad consensus when it comes to larger geological structures, spanning several tens of miles. However, as we delve deeper, especially beyond the 125 miles mark and up to 620 miles, the clarity diminishes. The repeatability of the data, its consistency, starts to wane. To break it down, teleseismic tomography is akin to taking an X-ray of the Earth's innards. It uses seismic waves, the very ripples that earthquakes produce, to craft detailed images of what lies beneath. But when it comes to Yellowstone, especially the deeper sections, these images have been somewhat blurry. The scientific community has grappled with inconsistencies, leading to debates and discussions. There's no unanimous agreement on the exact shape, location, continuity, or even the depth extent of the seismic wave speed anomalies right beneath Yellowstone. It's like trying to decipher a puzzle where some pieces don't quite fit. In essence, while we've made leaps and bounds in our understanding of Yellowstone, the depths beneath it remain enigmatic. So what's the current assessment from the YVO? They report no signs of imminent volcanic activity at Yellowstone. The magma chamber beneath the park's caldera is active, but not to the point of causing an eruption. The YVO also emphasizes that the chances of a Yellowstone eruption in our lifetimes are extremely low. Even if an eruption were to occur, it wouldn't be an apocalyptic event. However, some media sources and conspiracy theorists argue that Yellowstone is on the brink of eruption. These media outlets, as well as a few conspiracy theorists, are fanning the flames of unrest. Also, they hint at secret government evacuation plans, and even go as far as to suggest that the data from the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is being tampered with to prevent widespread panic. As proof, they point to videos showing animals seemingly fleeing the park or geysers behaving more erratically than usual. But let's take a step back and ask, how much of this is grounded in reality, and how much is mere speculation? First, let's address the media's portrayal of the situation at Yellowstone. It's undeniable that some reports have amplified the potential threat, using dramatic descriptors like overdue or catastrophic. They paint a picture of a super eruption, potentially plunging our planet into a volcanic winter. Yet many of these narratives gloss over the actual likelihood of such a cataclysmic event. From what we've understood, Yellowstone isn't exactly ticking down to a set eruption date. Volcanoes aren't like alarm clocks. They don't erupt on a strict timetable. They come to life when there's sufficient magma below the surface and the right amount of pressure to push it upwards. Presently, Yellowstone doesn't meet these criteria. The magma's supply isn't a steady stream, but varies due to factors like tectonic shifts, magma mixing, and gas accumulation. And the pressure? It's not at a level where it could break through the surrounding rock layers. Furthermore, even if Yellowstone were to erupt in the future, it's not guaranteed to be the super eruption that's often sensationalized. History shows us that most of Yellowstone's eruptions have been on a much smaller scale. So, if we were to envision a future eruption, it would more likely be a localized event, primarily affecting areas within or close to the park. While this would undoubtedly pose risk to those nearby, it wouldn't be the global catastrophe some predict. Now, onto the theories of government secrecy surrounding Yellowstone. There are whispers suggesting that the U.S. government has covert evacuation plans, with arrangements made with countries like Australia or Brazil to relocate millions. 
Some even believe that the government is using unconventional methods to either induce or prevent an eruption. But let's ground ourselves in facts. There's no concrete evidence to suggest that such a secret evacuation plan exists. Implementing such a massive operation would be a Herculean task, involving coordination on an unprecedented scale. Keeping it under wraps? Almost impossible. Additionally, the YVO operates with a high degree of transparency. It's a collaborative effort between nine state and federal agencies, all dedicated to understanding and sharing knowledge about Yellowstone. Their data is open to the public, and they're not the sole guardians of information on Yellowstone. Numerous independent scientists and institutions also monitor and study the volcano. The YVO also welcomes public inquiries and requests, and provides information and education materials on its website. Furthermore, there is no evidence or mechanism that the U.S. government or any other entity has been using any methods such as chemtrails, harp, or nuclear bombs to trigger or stop an eruption at Yellowstone. Among these, some theories stand out, not necessarily for their accuracy, but for their intrigue. Let's dive deep into these claims and see where science stands. First up, chemtrails. Picture the sky on a clear day, crisscrossed with white trails left behind by high-flying jets. Some voices in the conspiracy realm argue that these aren't just innocent contrails, but are, in fact, chemicals deliberately released for a myriad of dark purposes from manipulating the weather to controlling populations. But when we turn to the realm of science, the narrative simplifies. Contrails are the result of water vapor condensing and freezing around aircraft exhaust at high altitudes. The idea of them being anything more sinister lacks concrete scientific backing. Next, we have HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. Located in the icy terrains of Alaska, this facility delves deep into the mysteries of the ionosphere using powerful radio waves. Yet some suggest it's a tool with far-reaching capabilities, from altering weather patterns to inducing earthquakes or even controlling mines. But as intriguing as these claims might sound, they fall apart under scientific scrutiny. HARP's research, while profound, has no bearing on the geothermal activities of Yellowstone or the weather patterns across the globe. Then there's the mention of nuclear bombs devices of immense power that harness nuclear reactions. Some conspiracy corners suggest that these have been used in the past to influence volcanic eruptions, citing instances like Krakatoa or Pinatubo. But here's the reality. There's no scientific evidence to support the idea that nuclear detonations could influence volcanic behaviors, especially not at Yellowstone. These theories, while captivating, often stand on shaky ground when faced with empirical evidence. Institutions like the YVO, backed by rigorous data and research, often present a narrative that contradicts these speculative tales. Recently, whispers grew louder when parts of Yellowstone National Park temporarily closed due to flood damage. Some saw this as a sign, a harbinger of an impending volcanic eruption. But let's set the record straight. The closure was localized, primarily affecting Montana's northern regions. Torrential rains led to flash floods, necessitating the closure for public safety and infrastructure repair. This decision, far from being a cryptic message, was a straightforward response to natural events. And the YVO, ever vigilant, confirmed that Yellowstone's volcanic heartbeat remained steady and unchanged. So where does this leave us? Is the majestic Yellowstone a ticking time bomb? The consensus, based on current scientific understanding, suggests calm. Yellowstone, while undeniably powerful, shows no signs of an imminent eruption. The processes beneath its surface are intricate and ever-evolving, but not necessarily ominous. Yet it's essential to approach Yellowstone with a mix of awe and respect. While the immediate threat might be minimal, the park remains a testament to Earth's dynamic nature. Moreover, Yellowstone is not only a natural wonder, but also a natural laboratory where we can study the origins and workings of our planet and its volcanoes. I hope you enjoyed this video series and learned something new. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you have any questions or comments about this topic, please leave them below. I would love to hear your feedback. See you soon.